welcome to another of Mrs. Patmore's videos. Now it's been a long old time and um, a lovely summer in fact, which has gone very quickly I will say, um, but it is coming up to the time when if you are about to start in reception, uh, you've got about a week and a half before you come to us. So you must be feeling a little mixture of excitement and a little bit scared maybe as well. If you're extremely lucky, maybe you're not scared at all. You're just full of excitement. But either way, I think even some of that excitement could actually be a little bit of nerves as well. Now, I'm going to teach reception next year and I have to say that if you're watching this and you're going to be in my class next year, you have nothing to worry about. You probably still will a bit even after I've reassured you here, but you honestly have nothing to worry about. We have got a brand new classroom. There are lots, we're in the same room, but the room has been jazzed up. It's a brilliant reception classroom. There's a construction area. There is a maths area. There is a small world area where you can play with certain things like Happy Land and Lego and um, Barbies are there as well. Uh, there's a lovely art area, a science area where you can investigate things. There's an area to do cooking, an area to make your own toast bean bags to sit on, a reading area which is cosy under a little arch and a lovely massive role play area and that's before you even get outside. So I'm hoping to do another video of my classroom and I will post that just for the children that will be in my class next year. If you're watching this and you're not going to be in my class next year, don't worry, I'm sure your teacher is going to be absolutely lovely as well and I'm sure you'll have lots of new friends and you'll have a great time. Okay. This video is not so much about phonics and not so much about maths, which is what I did during lockdown. This one is to say, to give you an idea of 10 things that would be a good idea to have a little practice of over the next week and a half before you start school. And indeed, once you get to school, still keep doing them because then you'll become brilliant at all of these 10 things. That's a handy thing to remember, that both of, the, both of your hands, all the fingers on both of your hands, add up to 10, exactly 10 fingers and thumbs. So that might help us actually with what we're going to do for our top 10 things. I'm going to start at number one and work down to number 10. You don't have to tackle all of these in one day. You can pick a few on different days and work on them. But like I say, don't stop just because you started at school. Keep practicing them at home with your parents or with your brothers and sisters or nans and grandparents. Okay, nans and granddads, sorry. So, number one on our top 10 list of things to do to get you ready for reception is... Now, I haven't got any with me, but these are buttons on your uniform, okay? Now, unfortunately, my daughters are quite grown up now, so none of their shirts had this certain kind of button that I wanted to talk about. But often, on girls' shirts mainly, most of all, they do a little flower-shaped button. Often on the ones you have to do up here, and maybe the ones you have to do on your wrists here on your cuffs as well. Now these flower shaped buttons, although they look really pretty, they don't undo or do up very easily for tiny fingers. Okay, If you have bought this uniform with little flower buttons, don't rush back to the shop and, and take it back and change it for something else. Just sit with it on your lap a couple of times and have a practice doing it up and undoing it again, okay? Now, even if you haven't got flower-shaped buttons, it's a good idea to have a practice of this, even if your buttons are those really smooth circle ones. Still have a practice, because they're always tiny, and they're quite hard to do. We just assume we'll be able to do them, but generally our little hands work bigger, work better with bigger things. So smaller things can be sometimes quite a challenge. So, have a little practice. Put the shirt on your lap first of all, or the blouse, and have a practice at undoing and doing up those buttons. When you feel super confident, maybe put it on and have a go while looking down, squashing your chin down against your chest, and have a go at doing it then. This will help because you will start doing PE in your reception classes. And we generally hope as teachers, and certainly teaching assistants, that you can really get yourself dressed and undressed yourself, okay? So get yourself into your PE kit and out of your uniform, all by yourself, what's known as independently, meaning you don't need anybody else's help. Sometimes you might need a bit of help, in which case, do ask, don't sit there struggling, 
have a really good go and if you just think after a few minutes this isn't going to happen then ask for a bit of help okay maybe your teacher or teaching assistant will talk you through it while you do it maybe they'll help you the first couple of times but have a really good practice first if you have this sneaky practice at home then probably you won't even have to ask because you have got yourself as the perfect button opener and and uh, refasten them before you even have your first PE lesson. So that is number one. Practice doing your buttons on your clothing. Okay, number two. Number two are zips on coats, okay? Now, if you probably think that doesn't matter so much at the moment, you probably haven't gone out in the last few weeks really wearing a coat, or certainly a coat that's been done up. So zips have probably gone right to the back of your mind. But as we move into school and it's September, October, November, December, it starts getting colder and probably more chance of a bit of rain. So you will want to put on those coats when you get to school and you'll want to be doing up those zips, okay? Now that's another thing that teachers and teaching assistants love and that is children that can do up their own zips, okay? We still love you if you can't, we just think it's extra fab if you've already learned to do it, okay? If you're a teacher in a class of about 30, can you imagine 30 children, 10, 20, 30 children, a child for every one of my fingers, asking the teacher to do up their zip? You'd miss break time waiting for everybody to have theirs done up. So it'd be a really good idea if you can do it yourself. So whatever coat you've got for now that you're getting ready to wear, maybe when the weather turns a bit colder, have a practice. Maybe practice like with the buttons, having a go at doing it up and undoing it when it's just sitting on your lap in front of you or on the table. But then have a go putting it on and having a go at lining up those two bits you have to push inside each other because that's where the trickiness normally lies. The second you get those two bits together and you hold the bottom, then pulling the zip should be easy. Always remember to hold the bottom two bits of the coat before you pull up, it really helps, okay? Sometimes coats annoyingly have bits of material that keep poking in the way of the zip. Try and get yourself a coat that doesn't do this if you haven't bought one already, okay? So that's number two, zipping up your coat. Another very clever thing to remember also with number two is when you put your coat on, often those lovely new school jumpers that you've bought with the stretchy cuffs start to travel up your arm and you get stuck inside your coat with all your jumper up here like big muscles but nothing down here and it's a bit uncomfortable because you can't move around because your jumper's all pushed up here so a good tip for that when you're putting on your coat is to take these flappy fingers here and just pull your sleeve down and grab them with all of your fingers like this and then if you stay like that and don't let go and you put your arm in your coat and stay holding it the whole time, don't let go when it's halfway down your coat sleeve, you can let go when you see those ha that hand pop back out of the sleeve again and it will still be holding your sleeve on your jumper. Then you can let go and your jumper will stay exactly where it should be. So have a practice of doing that. Okay, number three. Number three, I have here some toilet roll. It's about going to the toilet. Now I'm sure most of you are absolutely fab at going to the toilet um, and, and doing everything yourself independently, there's that word again, doing everything all by yourself and not having to call out for your mum's or your dad's help. If so, that is fabulous. Well done you and pat yourself on the back. Just remember when you get to school, it'll be a toilet you haven't seen before. But it doesn't stop you from being independent, from doing everything yourself. As long as you know where the tissue is, the toilet roll, as long as you know how to get up onto the toilet, maybe there's a little stool there to help you if it seems higher than the one at home, and then you know where the sink and the soap is, then that's all you really need to know. So maybe before you go in there, before you're desperate for the toilet, have a look in your school loo and just check that you know where all these things are, the toilet paper, the sink, make sure you can get onto the toilet and then you know where the soap is, okay? So make sure you familiarise, you get to know the toilet at school. Sometimes you can get in a bit of a panic just because it all seems quite new. Now do remember with your toilet, don't just do one wipe, okay? You have to keep going, especially if it's been a smelly one. You have to keep wiping until your tissue is clean, okay? So you sometimes, although it sounds a bit revolting, you have to wipe that bottom and then check your paper, okay? Don't bring it near your face. You can hold it quite far away away, but check to see if it's clean. 
if you have to wet, maybe you have to wipe it four or five times. You never know, okay? But you need to go until that tissue looks nice and clean like this. Then that means you are safe to pull up your pants or your knickers because you've taken care of business, okay? So make sure it's not always just one wipe. Sometimes it can be four, five, six wipes before that tissue looks clean. Also, don't forget when you are pulling up your, your underwear, particularly if you're wearing a pinafore dress or skirt, before you come out, make sure that it's the skirt part is not tucked into your knickers or your tights because often that can happen in reception classes and you're walking around and you don't realise that all of your bottom is on show at the back with your knickers on of course. So don't forget to check that your skirt is pulled out of your tights and your knickers and all will be fabulous. Okay, number four. Number four is one that isn't quite as much fun as doing your buttons, okay, or practicing with your zip. It might seem a bit like trickier or harder work, okay. Number four is writing your name, okay. Now, you may be, it may be that you can already do this. Many children do come to reception class and they already know exactly how to write their name. If this is the case, another chance to pat yourself on the back fantastic work and well done mums and dads and all family members that have helped you out with that. This is so helpful because when you start doing work in school there's lots of other people that are doing maybe similar things to you or they're painting at the same time as you or they're doing some great writing at the same desk as you and you don't want to get your work mixed up. So it's really great to know how to write your name on the back of your work so that when it goes on the drying rack or it gets put in a pile on the table. You can see at the end of the day which bit is yours because your name is on there and you get to take the right one home. So it is very important to be able to recognize your name and write your name. So a good idea, if you haven't learned to do this, do not panic, it is fine. Because I know I will help the people in my class and I'm sure the other teachers will help in, uh, in your class if you're not coming into my room. But a good way to have a practice, and you can do this once you get to school as well, it doesn't just have to be in these summer holidays. A good idea is, on a piece of paper or indeed a board like my own, I'm going to have a little nearer, is to have your name written for you by mums and dads if you can't write it yourself. And then maybe they might have a go at writing your name by putting it in dots like a dot to dot you might see in an activity book. So it's not quite written, it's dotty, and you've got to join the dots up to write it. And then maybe a space at the bottom for when you've had a go at copying over your, your written name, then having a go at joining the dots, you can then have a go at writing it all by yourself, okay? And you don't just do this once, do this loads of times until you don't need to go over the top of your name, you don't need to join the dots, you can just write your name straight away without even thinking about it, okay? So I'll just show you for now then, with Mrs. Pat Knoll at the top here, you could, and it's not easy to do holding it up, so don't you do this, you lay it down on a table and get yourself nice and comfortable and hold your pen nice and comfortably. Now mine is written in cursive handwriting because we do cursive in my class when we start writing letters, okay? But if you've already wrote your name and you're in my class and you haven't learnt it cursively, that's absolutely fine. I'm not going to get you to change it. You just know how to write your name that way and that suits me fine, okay? But I'm going to show you mine in cursive. So I will take my pen and on the top one, I'll have a good look at it first. Maybe I might go over it with my finger. If you've got a whiteboard like mine, that'll probably rub it off. But if it's on a piece of paper, that's fine. So I might follow the shapes with my finger first. So I get to feel where they go, where they start and where they finish. That always helps. Sometimes taking your finger and pretending to write it on the carpet with your magic finger really helps at all as well. Sorry. So. I'm going to take my pen and I'm going to go up, down, up, down for my mm, and then my r. Oh, it's actually rubbing off what I've written here because I'm using another pen. So I'm copying all of the letters in my name here like this and writing over the top. So I haven't got to think too much about it because someone has kindly written it for me already. Possibly mum or dad or a brother or sister have already wrote it for me. So I haven't got to think too much. I've just got to think mainly about how I grip my pen and following those lines, okay? Then I'll have a go at joining the dots, put my pen at the bottom and go up. I've got a really bad writing board pen here, unfortunately, because I haven't been into the class for about six days and I haven't got myself a new pen. So we're going up, 
down, up, down. It's not showing here. Let me just try my other pen. This was the not so good one earlier, but perhaps it's a bit better. So I'm going to go up, down, up, down for my mmm. And then I'm following the dots here to do my cursive. Remember, don't worry if you haven't learnt it cursively. That's absolutely fine. In fact, I'd be very surprised if you had. And there's my missus. And then I'm going to do Patnell. So I'm going to follow those dots, joining them like I would in an activity book. Wishing round for my letter A, my A. Uh, up tall, down like an umbrella handle for my T. So I wrote P at Pat. N. A. And then my two alls on the end. So I've now copied over the top of this one, joined the dots on this one, and then I can have a go if I'm feeling confident of really looking at the ones above and having a go of writing my own. Is my pen going to work? Not really, but you know how it goes. Hang on, it's coming on live now. So I'm really looking. Okay, that's the p and I've got to do an ah. Uh, really looking and writing my name underneath and trying to remember how I wrote it. Okay, this is getting less clear as time goes on. But really studying what I wrote above, joining the dots and copying above, and then having a go at doing it myself. And do this lots of times, loads of times, whenever you've got a spare moment. I mean, even going along in the car is fine. It's a little bit joggy in the car, but it's certainly good practice. Okay, so that is writing your name. That was number four. Number five. Number five is scissor action, okay? Now, what I mean by that sounds kind of straightforward. It's when you've got a pair of scissors, okay? Some of you may be absolutely fabulous with scissors already. Maybe you do lots of craft at home and you can pick up a pair of scissors and go straight to work with them and cut whatever you want, okay? Now, generally, scissors in a classroom that children can use are not the greatest scissors either. We don't want them too sharp because we don't want you hurting yourself. So they can sometimes take a little more work than other scissors. You'll suddenly see your teacher come along with their big scissors and chop straight for it and you think, how does that happen? So don't worry, it's not magic, they're just normally a little bit sharper, okay? So children's scissors are not always the greatest, we don't want you cutting any fingers off. So, with scissors they have two lots of holes in, okay? One is smaller and one is bigger, okay? The smaller one is for your thumb and the bigger one are for your two first fingers next to your thumb. So if I come a little closer, so you've got your thumb in here and two fingers go into that same hole together in the bigger hole. Okay. If you have left-handed scissors, there'll be a different colour, no doubt, in your classroom, and you can ask your teacher which ones are for left hands, and they will let you know which colour ones they are. If you're not sure, you don't like to ask, you can normally tell because they just won't be cutting very well at all, in which case go for the other colour and try those out. So, with my scissors here, with my thumb in the smaller hole and my two fingers next to my thumb in the bigger hole, I'm going to practice first. Now, I don't want you cutting anything off of yourself, so hold them well away from yourself, okay? Keep nice and safe. Make sure you're not poking them in anybody else's eyes if you have younger brothers or sisters. And I just want you to have a little practice with these scissors of bringing your thumb towards your fingers and your fingers towards your thumb. And when you do this, you will see... And you see the jaws of the scissors going backwards and forwards, a bit like a bird's beak opening and closing, or the jaws of a shark. And that's you doing all of that work, bringing your thumb and fingers together like this, okay? Now have a really good practice of doing that before you even attempt to do any cutting. But if you feel confident and it seems to be working and you're getting that action right, then have a go doing that action, but with a piece of paper in the middle of the two jaws and then it should cut as you squeeze your thumb and finger together okay now it doesn't hurt to have a go at maybe getting parents to draw squiggly lines on a piece of paper and you cutting along the squiggly line so you learn to you move your hand in different directions while still squeezing your thumb and fingers together so it's lots going on at once and your mind thinking about where you need to go next it's a busy old task so don't worry if you don't get it straight away, but it's a really good one to practice because there'll be lots of crafts going on in your classroom and you'll want to get straight down and start cutting to do exactly what you want. And you don't want to have to keep asking someone to help you. If you do, of course, then fine, go for it and ask. God, I imagine your teachers will encourage you to have a go yourself to be more independent doing it by yourself. 
So have a really good practice of a pair of safe scissors and remember as I say, be safe. Don't have them poked in anybody's eyes. Always remember as well when walking around a classroom to hold your scissors by putting your hand around the closed blade, okay? So don't have them open, have them closed and put your hand around it and just the, the rounded circular bits at the top because that's a safer way. If you fall, you haven't got the pointy pokey bit that might pop into you, okay? So always walk around your classroom holding the closed together blades, the pointy bits and have the circles out on top. Very important. Right, okay, number six now, we're scooching through this. Number six, not so much fun, unless you particularly like this kind of thing. Number six is tidying up, okay? Now, in a reception class, most likely you're going to have what's known as continuous provision, and that's all the fun stuff. Okay, and it'll be all laid out, hopefully, on lovely shelves or maybe pull out drawers with photos on so you know where everything is. And it'll all be there and you'll be encouraged to use whatever you want to use, most likely. And if that's the case, that is fine. And I would be absolutely fine with this. I tell all of my children to use whatever they want. You know, they can take one from the math section and use it round in the construction area. That is absolutely fine. But at the end of that session and your teacher might ring the tambourine or she might, uh, I don't know, count down from five to get your attention. She will probably want you then to tidy up, okay? This is a very important part of reception. Sometimes some children think, if I hide over here in the corner, all my friends can do all the work and I'll just sit over here. That's not a good thing, and believe me, your teacher or teaching assistant will notice, okay? So don't try and hide. There's no point. It's not fair on your friends, is it? Because you're asking them to tidy up your mess, okay? So the best thing to do is to knuckle down and have a good go at tidying up as much as your friends, because then you're helping each other, aren't you? Sometimes, if there's a lot of stuff to tidy up in my room or outdoors, in the outdoor area, I might say there's a, there's a magic item and whoever picks this item up and tidies it away gets a sticker or something like that or maybe something a bit special and that means the more things you tidy up the more likely you are to be the one who picks up the magic special item. Now try to avoid going up to your teacher if they do this saying is this the special item is this the special item because they won't tell you they will keep it a secret until the end so that you tidy up as many things as you can so maybe you'll be the person who gets the sticker, okay? So when, you've, when you're using your items and you've picked something out of one area and you're using it over here, you've got to put it back where it came from. So part of you has to remember, where did I get this pair of scissors from? Where did I get these beautiful sequins from? And then you have to take them back to the right area. So a good idea to practice this would be to help have a little tidy up at home. I am without a doubt thinking your bedrooms have probably been quite messy at some point. It's the summer holidays, it happens. So I think rather than your mums or dads or grandparents coming round to tidy up your room, why don't you say, Mum, I've got this, I'm going to have a go at tidying. And see if you can remember where that big pink teddy goes and where those fast cars go on your shelf. Have a go yourself. Be independent, doing it yourself, not needing someone to help you. It's a great feeling, it really is. Okay, so number seven okay I've got five fingers here and two more six seven number seven number seven is this is quite handy I imagine you have lots of stories at home and if you don't already don't worry because I I'm sure all your teachers and certainly I will be reading hundreds of stories to you over the next year okay but if you are having lots of stories at home, there are some ones that you absolutely love. They just stick in your mind and you really love them and you want to hear them time and time again. A good idea is if you get really good at telling that story, okay? So maybe not just waiting for your parents to open the book and tell it. You could remember it and tell it to other people. Maybe your cousins or your friends that you meet up with or your dad or your nan. You could be the storyteller rather than waiting for the adult. So what you could do is have your favourite book 
have someone read it to you and then sit down with that adult and have a go at doing a story map. Now I'll be doing a few of these in my classroom over the, uh, the course of your reception year. Now this one is just a little quick one that only does part of the story. But when you write your map full of pictures, <clears throat> it will be the whole story. And then you'll use this map and then you'll probably create actions to help you remember and you can go around and tell the story to everybody without missing out bits. So you can tell by looking at this story map, I hope it's nice and clear, that I have three animals with snouts at the top here. So I've probably got one, two, three kind of little pigs. So this is the story map or part of the story map for the three little pigs. So you can see in my first picture, they're all saying goodbye to their mums because they're off for a walk. So you might say, um, you might start with once upon a time there were three little pigs and then you could do a sign like this for pigs meaning their snout maybe or something like that. So one way to help you remember the words that the story starts. Then you might go on to the first little pig decided to build his house, so he's thinking about it here, out of hay. Okay, so you might do some actions that say the first little pig decided to build his house out of, hmm, kind of tricky, I'm going to let you think of something for hay. So that is a story map. Now remember to do it for the whole story, use arrows to see which direction the story goes in so you don't get muddled up with the pictures. And don't draw too many pictures because it'll just, it's just little ones that help you remember what comes next in the story. So you could pick your favourite story that you have at bedtime or even during the day and then sit with an adult and draw a story map to match your favourite story and then make some actions up to help you remember exactly how the story is told. So you can have a go at doing that. We'll be doing that quite a bit in my classroom as we move on throughout the reception year. So it'd be really good fun to have a practice at home with your parents. Okay, so that is remembering a story from a story map. Our next one is creating your own story. Okay, so this is number eight. Got five fingers there, six, seven, eight. This is number eight. So creating your own story. Now I do this a lot in my classroom. There's always a lovely writing table and at any point you can sit down with an adult as long as you've called them over and they're not busy talking to somebody else. Call them over and they can sit and this is in my class, I don't know if it will be in everybody's who's watching but I'm sure your teachers would love you to sit down and have a go at writing a story and you will tell your story to the adult who will write it out for you. Okay? So you can have a practice of doing this before you get to school or oh, indeed do it at home all the time whenever you want to as long as you've got an adult or an older brother or sister there to help you so you could think of your own story so not a story you've heard from a book already but something you've made up yourself out of your own imagination okay sometimes when we tell these stories we borrow a little bit from other stories that we've heard already that's absolutely fine perhaps your story will have three pigs in but maybe they won't be building themselves houses maybe they're off to go and live in spain so it's up to you you can use things that you've maybe done in your own life or things you've heard other people say or little things from other books and just push it all into your own story using your own imagination. So have a practice at home with an adult. You can always start your story once upon a time, as many books do. It's entirely up to you. It's your story. But as you write it, get your adult to write the very story that you are telling them, okay? It can be quite a short story. It doesn't have to be really long. It can be a really short story in that once upon a time there was a dragon who ate lots of cheese and it made his toenails grow really long. So when he went to get them cut, he found out that when the scissors came near to toenails, they just disappeared back into his foot. So he went home and lived happily ever after. The end. So it can be a short story. It doesn't have to be huge. You get to decide the characters. You get to decide what happens, where it happens. It's your story. So have a go at doing that with an adult at home. In my class, when we've done these, we peg them up. And when we get a chance at the end of the day, we act them out, okay? And you introduce it, 
I'd like you to uh, to sit down now, please, and listen to my story of the dragon and the long toenails. And you will get to pick who is going to play those parts in my classroom. Sometimes we don't have time to do everybody's at the end of the day, but we just, we're a little patient. We relax and wait and do it again the next day. So that's a good thing to practice at home with an adult. Telling an adult your story while they write it down for you. Okay. Number nine, I've got five fingers there, six, seven, eight, nine. Number nine is counting objects, okay? Now, you may have done no counting whatsoever, that's absolutely fine, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to have done so. But if you do regularly count, maybe you did it in nursery or at home and you're really good at it, then take your hand and give yourself a pat on the back. If not, don't worry. I'm sure all of your lovely new teachers, and indeed myself, will teach you to count. But a good way to do counting is to use everyday objects, okay? And maybe your parents or your brothers and sisters can ask you to do little jobs for them and you'll be like, that's okay, I can do this because I can count. So maybe there are five people in your family. Okay, maybe you have mum, dad, and some brothers or sisters, okay? Or it could be mum and lots of brothers or something like that. But you, maybe you've got five people in your house, okay? And so mum could maybe say to you, could you get five forks out of the drawer for everybody for dinner? So you'd go to the drawer and you would get the forks like this and you would count them out to check you had enough for everybody. Five, if there's five in your family. If there's three or six, then obviously that would be the number you'd count out. So you would count them one, while touching them one at a time so you don't get confused. Two, three, touching it and putting it down. Four, not going too fast as I take it from this hand. Five. I can lay them out in front of me nice and neat as well and double check if I want to by touching each one as I count. Don't count too fast because you will end up with the wrong number. So as you touch one, you say one number. So one, two, three, four, five. And then you can go and lay them on the dinner table. Job done. You've really helped out there because you have learned to count. So do that with lots of things. Knives, forks, um, what else might you need? Maybe uh, someone's doing your hair and you need four hair bands for your plaits. So go and find four hair bands from the hair band box. Uh, maybe you are going out for a picnic and mum says we're going to need um, three apples for everybody. So go to the fruit bowl and practice counting one, two, three apples okay so have a really good practice at counting to five if you're sitting there right now and you're thinking mrs pat no i've been counting to five for ages if that is the case then maybe push yourself to counting up to 10 objects so maybe with my package of tomatoes here you might be helping um dad cook the dinner and he says, oh, I need some tomatoes. And you might be like, I'll get those, Dad, but how many do I need to get? And he might think to himself how many people he's got eating dinner. And he might say, I need 10 tomatoes. So you want to get that pack and you want to count them as you touch each one. Don't go too fast, only as you touch one and maybe move it to another place do you count a number. So one, two, three. Four, five, six, Ooh, stuck on the vine, seven, eight, Ooh. nine, and ten. So I know that I've got to put two away in the fridge. So I don't need all of them. If I'd have just got the packet, Dad would have had the wrong number of tomatoes. So I counted each one as I touched it. Don't forget, you can always check your counting. Let's have a check. Let me tilt our camera a little bit. So we check by touching each one as we say a number. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I definitely know I've got it right because I've checked twice.
twice. Fantastic. So that's counting to five or ten. You can always help by knowing that you've got five fingers on one hand. One, two, three, four, five. So if I was getting five forks, I'd want one fork for every finger and thumb on that one hand. Or if you put two hands together, five add five, it's going to make ten. Let's just double check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, always, and that will never change. If you're not familiar with the counting of numbers, then maybe have a look online for a 100 square. That's really good for helping you count or a number line to 20. There's lots of images online to help you out with that. So you get used to seeing those numbers. Sometimes as well, we can count to 20 just by saying it, but we're not quite sure what that 20 means. Whereas if you actually have objects in your counting, you know what 20 means. And you can then see that 20 looks like more than 10 okay 10 looks like more than five so it gets you used to knowing the fiveness of five okay so that's counting my last one okay now this one is mainly for my class okay I don't know if your teachers will be teaching you cursive writing in your reception class next year it might be quite unusual to be the case, but we do teach cursive writing in my class. So if you're in my class next year, okay, then we will do the cursive alphabet. Now I'm gonna write a couple of the letters on the board just so you see how they look, and maybe they might look a bit different. Not much different, but a little bit different to how you might have seen them already. But you need to know how they look in your reading books when they're not cursive, and how they look when we're learning to write them when they are cursive, with the little whooshes at the beginning and the end. Okay, and you'll be amazed how quick you remember both. Okay, it's not like you start to only think cursive and you don't recognise the ordinary ones. You will become brilliant at both. Okay, now remember if you wrote your name already and it's not cursive, don't mind. Keep it as it is. That is fine. And we won't be writing letters straight away in my class. We'll be doing phase one of phonics first, which is more about sound and rhyme and alliteration which is a great word I'll tell you all about. So I'll just show you a couple of letters because my pen is not doing as it should do, as we know. But um, if you are in my class, then parents, I will give you a sheet that shows you how we write all of the cursive letters. So don't panic if you think, oh, I have no idea how to tell my child where to start and where to finish on these letters, because I will certainly show you that in the first week. If you're in, uh, going in someone else's class, I have a lovely teacher, then I'm sure they will teach you or tell parents about how they want you to form your letters as well. So for the letter A, let's say, it would be one of, one of the first ones we learn, not necessarily the first. We always start every cur cursive letter down at the bottom, down here, and whoosh upwards. And we go round, come back round this way, and then up to the top and down. So you might have seen an A written in books where it just looks like this. And you can see there's not a great deal of difference between the two. So that's how easy it will be for you to recognise the cursive one when we write it and how it will be written in your reading books. So they're really not that different, OK? But with cursive, we tend to whoosh into the letter and then we just have a nice extra flick on the end there, OK? And if I do a B for you... Then we same we start at the bottom, always start at the bottom. This is the best thing about cursive. You start at the same place for every letter. Whereas other letters, you've got to try and think, where do I put my pen to start this? And then you feel like you don't want to start at all. But with cursive, you always start at the bottom. And we wish up tall for our b down, back around, and then there's a little tickle of the belly underneath. So you are cursive flick to finish, okay? But like I say, only worry about this if you've heard you're doing cursive in your class and then actually don't worry at all. Just know that this will affect you more than, um, than if you're going in to do ordinary letter writing, okay? So, and as you can see, if I do a book that you'll see in your reading books, it really doesn't look that different, does it? The only difference is we've got a cursive whoosh here and a whoosh to finish, which you don't have on this one. So they're really not that much different. So parents, if you're worrying about the cursing, worry no more, because I will certainly show you, if you're in my class, how we form those letters in the first few weeks so you can help your children at home. And if you are doing it in your classes uh, and you're not in my class, then I'm sure your teachers will let you know as well. Okay? So that's just really, just to let you know, 
that there is cursive coming in my class and so number 10 isn't really something you can sit and practice just now just be aware that it will exist in our classroom okay so that are that those are should i say the 10 things that i think if you have a little practice of before you come into school and indeed once you're at school you still keep doing it when you go home to learn because it will make you an absolute genius of those different things, okay? So you'll be ready for PE in no time, you'll be ready for going out with your coat on at lunchtime, you will just be ready for anything. No one will take your work home because your name's not on it because you will be able to write your name, okay? So I will be looking forward to seeing you guys and on the uh, 7th of September, I've lost all track of dates in this time, and I hope you're looking forward to meeting me too. And I will see you soon. Bye-bye.